allons-y. Donc bonjour à tous. Donc, nous allons avoir donc, un web séminaire, donc, le deuxième web séminaire de l'année des réseaux, organisé par le réseau des plasmas froids. Donc, comme d'habitude, il va durer environ 50 minutes. Vous avez eu le lien euh, envoyé par euh, mail il y a quelques semaines et puis un rappel il y a une heure. Euh, et à la suite de ce web séminaire, vous pourrez poser des questions donc, sur la plateforme Slido. Donc n'hésitez pas à poser des questions durant le web séminaire et puis un petit peu après. Euh, et donc ce web séminaire va être donné par euh, Monica Mag Magureanu euh, en anglais, donc, qui est euh, euh, Senior Researcher. Donc, in, in the National Institute for Laser, Plasma and Radiation Physics, in Bucharest, in, uh, en Roumanie. Uh, donc, uh, voilà, je te laisse la parole. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start by um, thanking my friends here in Grammy for their hospitality. And among them, of course, Hervé for the opportunity to give this talk. So the talk concerns the degradation of uh, organic pollutants in water by uh, non-thermal plasma. And I will give two examples, the degradation of pharmaceutical compounds and the degradation of pesticides. So regarding pharmaceuticals, I will say a few words about the sources of these compounds in water. Uh, then I will uh, enumerate some of the um, pharmaceuticals most commonly found in the environment and I will talk about their degradation by plasma. First, I'll show a few configurations of plasma reactors, and uh, then I will uh, talk about the most important parameters that are followed in these cases, the removal of the target compounds and the mineralization. And um, it is also important to increase the biodegradability of the treated uh, effluent and to uh, reduce the toxicity. Correlated with the toxicity, it's important to uh, identify the degradation products because they can also be harmful and in some cases even more harmful than the parent compounds. And of course, it's also important to uh, follow the degradation pathways and to understand the, the mechanisms. Uh, this is a picture uh, that I took at home. These are the medicine that my mother takes either on a regular basis or occasionally. And like her, there are many, many patients with one or two chronic diseases. So it's no wonder that the consumption of pharmaceuticals is huge. And in fact, it has been uh, rising constantly during uh, the last years. And this is due to several reasons such as the population growth and the inverting age structure, as well as the appearance of new target age groups, uh, the discovery of new drugs or of new uses for the existing ones. So as you see, the figures are quite alarming. There are uh, thousands or even tens of thousands of tons of pharmaceuticals that are consumed each year. And of course, this leads to an increased risk of water contamination. Some of these compounds are persistent and uh, accumulate in the environment. Then there is also uh, the risk of bioaccumulation. The toxicity of pharmaceuticals is uh, quite a big problem and uh, not only of the parent compound, but also of their metabolites and degradation products. Uh, regarding uh, aquatic species, they are uh, exposed to a cocktail of such substances, even if the individual concentrations can be relatively small and maybe uh, individually they have no effect. In mixtures, the effects can be additive and uh, there is uh, limited knowledge on this global effect on aquatic species. Uh, regarding human health, it is more or less the same problem. So humans can be exposed to pharmaceuticals through drinking water or through food um, contaminated with, uh, irrigated with contaminated water. Uh, so again, we have exposure to trace amounts of pharmaceuticals over a long time. So the effects again can be uh, quite unpredictable. Regarding the sources of pharmaceutical compounds in water, uh, so excretion is considered as the most important source of water contamination 
So excreted uh, human pharmaceuticals from households or hospitals uh, pass through the sewage network and then they reach wastewater treatment plants. Uh, there, some of them are degraded, but uh, not all of them, and uh, many are not completely eliminated during this treatment, so they are uh, transported and contaminate uh, surface water. Uh, then, uh, veterinary pharmaceuticals firstly contaminate soil, mainly by manure spreading in the fields, and then by runoff and leaching, they reach surface and groundwater. Another source of water contamination is the uh, sludge from the wastewater treatment plants that may also contain undegraded pharmaceuticals and uh, is used as fertilizer, so it has basically the same fate. Uh, disposal of unused medicine is also a source of uh, water pollu uh, pollution. So these medicines are deposited in landfills and then by leaching they can reach groundwater. And finally we have also waste disposal from um, pharmaceutical manufacturing facilities or uh, accidental spillings during the manufacturing or the uh, distribution process. So finally the contaminated ground and surface water dr uh, reach drinking water treatment plants but some of the pharmaceuticals can still escape this treatment and then they end up in uh, drinking water. Uh, here I have a graph with the removal efficiency of some pharmaceuticals, many in fact, in a wastewater treatment plant. So you probably don't uh, see their names because the letters are quite small, but what is important to see is that indeed there are a few uh, pharmaceuticals that are completely eliminated during classical treatment. There are some that are partially eliminated and there are also many where the um, removal efficiency, as you see, is negative and this means that the concentration in the effluent is uh, actually larger than in the influent. This has been observed uh, in several studies and has been explained uh, for instance, by sampling uncertainties or by uh, the presence of chemical transformation products or uh, by uh, adsorption-desorption processes. So the literature tells us that the total concentration of pharmaceuticals in um, the influent of wastewater treatment plants is of the order of some tens of micrograms per liter. And if we look at hospital effluents, the concentrations are much larger. So only for antibiotics, uh, there are tens to hundreds of micrograms per liter in the uh, hospital effluent. And for anti-inflammatories, the concentrations go up to milligram per liter uh, range. And then there is a lot of research focused on uh, dedicated treatments for uh, hospital wastewater. So the idea is to uh, treat the hospital wastewater directly at the source, separately from um, uh, municipal wastewater. And uh, this uh, map illustrates uh, such research. It's taken from a relatively uh, recent review and it covers uh, two decades of uh, research worldwide. Of course, uh, classical treatments are um, investigated, but also advanced oxidation processes, uh, such as ozone combined with UV radiation or with hydrogen peroxide and uh, UV phantom and photophantom processes and so on. And I believe it's a good idea to add non-thermal plasma on such a map because uh, similarly with uh, the other uh, more investigated up to now advanced oxidation processes, non-thermal plasma uh, can generate highly reactive uh, species such as the OH radical which is uh, a powerful oxidizer and um, is quite non-selective so it reacts with most uh, organic uh, compounds in, in the liquid. 
and an advantage, uh, an advantage of plasma as compared to the other uh, advanced oxidation processes is that, is that it doesn't need uh, oxidizers from an external source because it generates them uh, directly in situ. Here I've made a list of the pharmaceuticals that are most commonly found in the environment. I've tried to classify them uh, uh, according to their uh, therapeutic use. So we have antibiotics. Uh, the main problem with antibiotics is that um, antibiotic re resistant bacteria can, uh, can emerge. Uh, then we have also non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. In this case, uh, in in some of this, for some of these compounds, the removal in wastewater treatment plants can be uh, quite uh, efficient. However, the consumption is uh, very high, and uh, then there is, in the environment, uh, there is always a background concentration, so they are uh, pseudo-persistent compounds. We have the class of antihypertensives. Uh, in this case, many of these compounds are, uh, have very low removal rates by uh, classical treatment. Then we have also lipid regulators, antidepressants, anticonvulsants. Uh, carbamazepine is another example of a very recalcitrant uh, compound. And uh, we have also hormones. Um, in this case, the problem is that hormones can affect uh, um, negatively uh, the aquatic species even at very low uh, doses. And there are classes of compounds that I did not draw here, such as anti-cancer drugs or, for instance, um, contrast, contrast media and so on. So I marked with uh, yellow the pharmaceuticals that have been detected uh, even in drinking water, and I've marked with pink uh, the pharmaceuticals that have been investigated by uh, non-thermal plasma. And now I'd like to move to the um, design of plasma reactors, and I will start with uh, discharges in liquid. For instance, this, um, uh, this pulsed corona discharge generated uh, in, um, directly in liquid in um, wire to cylinder configuration. It is used by a research group in INP Greifswald, and as you see, it looks quite nice. It extends almost in the entire volume of the liquid, and it has been used to degrade a number of uh, pharmaceutical compounds belonging to different classes. Uh, what we also observe is that the efficiency uh, or the, the G value. The G value is the amount of uh, pharmaceutical destroyed per unit of energy, in this case per, per kilowatt hour energy introduced in the process. So as I said, the G value is relatively small, but we have to take into account that the concentration, the initial concentration was quite small, and then the authors decided to uh, calculate the uh, electrical energy per order, the amount of electrical energy required to reduce the concentration of pharmaceutical by one order of magnitude. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about the discharges in contact with liquid, and I'll start with uh, discharges above liquid. Uh, this is a configuration that we are uh, using for uh, quite some time, a corona discharge above liquid where the high voltage electrode is an array of um, 15, 20 copper wires, very thin wires. So the discharge is generated um, in the gas phase. It starts at the wires and it propagates towards the surface of the liquid. Obviously, it's a filamentary discharge, as you see here. We have used it to uh, degrade a number of uh, pharmaceutical compounds and also some uh, pesticides, as you will see in the following. A similar configuration is used uh, in, the, in a research group in Padova, in the group of Cristina Paradisi. Uh, in this case, they are having a DBD, so they have a, a dielectric barrier 
between the two electrodes and they have only two wires and again they used it for uh, the degradation of many uh, substances and among them uh, pharmaceuticals and pesticides. This here you have an example for, for the antihypertensive verapamil. Another uh, configuration of uh, corona discharge above water is this one, a point to plate configuration in this case. Again, the discharge is filamentary, it starts at the point, uh, point electrode and it propagates to the surface of the liquid. Um, it was used to degrade several pharmaceuticals belonging to different classes. And what is remarkable is that this is one of the few studies uh, at pilot scale with large uh, volumes of liquid, 150 liters. They are also using uh, real wastewater or spiked surface water. And the concentrations of pharmaceuticals are of the order of tens to hundreds of nanograms per liter. So they are basically the concentrations that are found in the environment. <coughs> Uh, in all these cases, the depth of the liquid is about uh, five millimeters, so several millimeters. And as we know, the penetration depth of the reactive species generated in the plasma into the liquid is quite small. So uh, people thought about re uh, reducing the, the depth of the liquid or, uh, in fact, increasing the ratio of the surface to volume. And uh, configurations like this one has, have been uh, developed. This is a dielectric barrier discharge with liquid falling film. It is used uh, by a research group in Belgrade. So as you see, it's a cylindrical uh, DBD configuration. The liquid is pumped through the inner electrode and then falls as a thin film on the surface of the inner electrode. And uh, the discharge is uh, here, again, in the gas phase and in contact with the liquid. Uh, there is also a nice uh, planar configuration uh, developed uh, in a research group in Germany, uh, also with liquid falling film. And we are also using something similar to this one, but the liquid is pumped uh, from, uh, from above. And another configuration is this one, the wetted wall corona. And in this case, there is an, uh, a wire electrode and the liquid falls as a thin film on the inner surface of the outer electrode. Another uh, nice configuration is um, uh, this one the corona with uh, liquid droplets. It's a pulsed corona discharge, uh, where the, um, which is generated at, at the wires. It's similar with an electrostatic precipitator, in fact. So the plasma is, as you see here, generated uh, close to the wires, and the liquid uh, falls as droplets or small jets um, on the, uh, through, the, through the plasma zone. Then there is uh, quite a large contact area between the plasma and the liquid, and uh, they are quite successful. They obtain a very high removal efficiency due, due to this efficient mass transfer of the species to the, uh, to the liquid. And from uh, what I know, they recently patented this uh, configuration, and they are using it for uh, real hospital wastewater. We have been using for a while a uh, configuration where we combine uh, plasma and ozonation. In fact, it's not really ozonation, it's more like gas recycling because we are using the gas generated in the plasma, which contains quite a lot of ozone, and we bubble it through the uh, solution that is contained in a solution reservoir. So we have continuous circulation of the solution between the plasma reactor and the reservoir, and again, the bubbling of the uh, gas containing ozone through this uh, solution reservoir. And we had a look at, uh, at the uh, ozone that is formed in the gas phase, and as you see, there are quite large concentrations 
this is the case when we have water in the reactor, but when we have um, only, only uh, the plasma and not the bubbling, there is very little consumption of this ozone. So most of it just passes uh, unreacted or without having any reaction, in fact. So then we thought about this bubbling and with the bubbling in the first uh, few minutes, all the ozone that is generated in the plasma is basically consumed in reactions with the uh, with the organic uh, molecules and so here we have the, the ozone consumption and only after the uh, organic compound is completely removed the um, uh, consumption of ozone uh, decreases significantly. And as you will see further on this uh, combination of plasma with uh, ozonation was found to considerably improve the uh, uh, removal efficiency of the organic pollutants. And now I'd like to talk about the removal efficiency and the uh, removal itself. So the removal is given, of course, by this formula. And the removal efficiency, as I said before, it's the amount of uh, pollutant that is removed per unit of uh, energy introduced in the process. And I have here a few examples for uh, ibuprofen. This is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And as you see, uh, complete removal can be uh, obtained uh, for various uh, input energies. Uh, this is, again, the removal um, as a function of the energy dose. And here we have a comparison of uh, several uh, discharge configurations and the results. So what we can see is that in, um, in lab uh, studies, uh, usually the concentration is the, of, some, uh, of some tens of uh, milligrams per liter. This is obviously orders of magnitude higher than what is actually find, found in uh, wastewater. Uh, then the volumes are generally uh, small, hun uh, hundreds of milliliters, with this exception that I uh, told you about of the um, corona with uh, droplets. Uh, the power introduced in the discharge can vary quite uh, in a large uh, range. And eventually, sooner or later, the removal can be uh, quite, uh, quite high or even complete removal can be obtained. But the energy uh, yields, the efficiency um, varies again quite widely. So we can have quite low uh, removal efficiency, such as the, uh, in the corona directly in liquid, uh, then uh, removals of uh, one uh, below 10, anyway, um, gram per kilowatt hour and relatively high removal, such as 28 or 26 that we have obtained. In this case, where the, um, uh, there is a good mass transfer of the species from the plasma to the liquid. This is another example. This is um, quite a good energy efficiency, 100 gram per kilowatt hour. We have obtained this in a DBD with liquid falling film combined with ozonation. Uh, so this is, these are the results for uh, amoxicillin and we had also some tens of uh, gram per kilowatt hour for other uh, beta-lactam an antibiotics such as oxacillin and, and this is the comparison between uh, plasma alone and plasma ozonation. Um, we've done these experiments in the corona above liquid, again combined with ozonation. And the target compound was methylparaben. Methylparaben is actually not a pharmaceutical, but um, it is a, in fact a preservative and it's found in uh, many pharmaceutical formulations. So as you see, uh, the, these are the results obtained by plasma alone and the degradation becomes much faster for uh, plasma ozonation. A few words about the mineralization. So mineralization means the complete elimination of the organic compounds to produce uh, carbon dioxide and water and eventually some uh, inorganic compounds. 
um, we can determine this by total organic carbon analysis. This is very useful, especially for multi-component solutions because it's a non-specific measure of uh, all the organic compounds in a sample. Uh, and what we can see in these two examples is, first of all, that um, as we expected, the mineralization is much, much slower than the degradation, the removal of the, of the parent compound, obviously, because this is a gradual process. The molecule becomes smaller and smaller by, uh, uh, by these uh, degradation steps. And then again, there is the comparison between uh, plasma alone and plasma ozonation. So this is effective not even for the, for the removal, but also for mineralization. As you see here, we have um, after 60 minutes of uh, treatment, about 30% uh, removal of the total organic carbon while in the plasma, while in by plasma ozonation we obtain much uh, larger uh, figures for the mineralization. A few words about the biodegradability as well. So um, biodegradability is given by this ratio of the biological oxygen demand over uh, chemical oxygen demand. And what is important in these uh, examples is that even if the mineralization is rather low, or if uh, there is no mineralization, we can improve the biodegradability of the treated effluent by uh, non-thermal plasma. And uh, toxicity tests, uh, they are quite, uh, quite rare in the literature. Uh, they are done usually using test organisms such as Vibrio fischeri, Artemia salina, Daphnia magna and so on. The important parameter is the LCS50, and this is the effluent concentration that is lethal to 50% of the test organisms. And as I said, there are very few uh, toxicity studies, and I believe uh, some more research efforts should be dedicated to, to this issue. Um, a few words about the degradation products. So to identify the degradation products is, is quite, uh, quite a complicated uh, thing. They are, uh, this is usually done by uh, LCMS, liquid chromatography coupled with mass spectrometry. So the compounds are separated by uh, chromatography and uh, then the identification of the compounds is done by, uh, uh, by uh, MS and sometimes even MSMS analysis is uh, needed uh, in order to, uh, to be able to identify these compounds. So as I said, for me as a physicist, uh, this problem is a bit complicated and uh, I'm very thankful to, to the chemists that uh, are on my team and are doing all this job. So this is an example for uh, enalapril. And as you see, there are several pathways for the degradation of enalapril. Uh, there is uh, hydrolysis to yield enalaprilate and then intramolecular uh, dehydration to yield this uh, diketopiperazine, which is a quite common uh, degradation product of, uh, enala product of enalapril. And then uh, there are also some other pathways. We have oxidation here and here, and again, uh, hydrolysis and so on. And we've tried to uh, follow these compounds during uh, the, the treatment. We have here the degradation of enalapril, which you see is quite, uh, quite slow. We need 120 minutes to completely eliminate it. And then uh, the, um, the appearance of uh, enalaprilate and diketopiperazine, this happens relatively fast after the plasma is started. And then they start again, to, uh, they start to be, to be degraded as well. Uh, this is the case of enalaprilate and the keto uh, is formed from another source but then is, uh, um, is degraded again. This happens to most of the um, degradation products. So 
uh, they are formed, as I said, soon after the plasma is started. They reach a maximum and then uh, they are uh, degraded and uh, sooner or later they are completely eliminated. But there are also uh, products that uh, are formed uh, later and uh, they uh, still um, accumulate in the solution even for uh, long treatment times. And now I will uh, switch to, to pesticides. I'll say a few words about the fate of the pesticides in the environment, and uh, then I will talk about their degradation by, uh, by plasma and by combinations of plasma with uh, other removal processes, such as ozonation, adsorption, catalysis. I'll say a few words about the influence of the electrical circuit on the removal efficiency. Uh, a few words again about the degradation mechanisms and uh, something about toxicity tests in connection with the possible reuse of the uh, treated water. So we can define pesticides as substances that are meant to prevent, control or destroy pests. Uh, they can be classified uh, according to the target organism, the most important are the herbicides because they account to uh, approximately 80% of the total pesticide used. And then of course there are also insecticides, fungicides and so on. The problem is that this, all these uh, compounds can be um, harmful and can affect uh, non-target organisms as well. They can also be classified by the chemical family and uh, I have here uh, a few of the most important uh, such families and a few examples for, uh, for each uh, of them. So for the organochlorines, uh, the most famous is DDT. Aldrin is also uh, quite uh, well known. Then there are the carbamates. They are organic compounds derived from the carbamic acid, which you see here, the general formula is here. And here we have aldicarb, which is uh, one of the most uh, important of this uh, class. Organophosphates, which are esters of the phosphoric acids. And as examples, parathion and malathion. Then the phenoxy family, they are carboxylic acids with a phenoxy group. And uh, 2,4-D is one of the most widely used and most widely investigated. And the uh, triazine family, uh, they are compounds uh, with uh, heterocycles containing nitrogen as in atrazine, simazine and so on. So what happens when, um, when the pesticide uh, is um, put in the fields? So um, adsorption can happen. Can, can, can happen and this depends on the, on the soil properties and on the chemical properties of the pesticide. Then we can have uh, leaching in case of heavy rain. This again depends on the soil properties, on the chemical properties of the pesticide and of course on the volume of the water flow and it leads to the contamination of uh, groundwater. We can have also runoff, and this is the transport of the pesticides into the uh, surface water. Uh, the pesticides in soil can be uh, degraded by uh, microorganisms. They can also be degraded chemically by uh, various uh, reactions such as uh, hydrolysis, oxidation, reduction and so on. And volatilization can also occur. So it looks like once they're applied in the fields, there is a little we can do to, to prevent uh, water pollu pollution with these uh, compounds. However, there are also other sources of uh, pollution, such as uh, manufacturing facilities or equipment rinsing operations, uh, where the, and in this kind of wastewater, the concentration of pollutants is very high. Some hundreds of milligrams per liter and the volume is relatively low and then plasma could be used in such a situation. 
So these are some results that we have obtained with our uh, plasma ozonation configuration for the degradation of 2,4-D. And, um, and these are the results obtained with uh, plasma alone. Uh, the blue one is with ozone treatment alone and the plasma ozonation clearly gives better results. So the degradation is faster and more efficient. And we believe that this improvement in uh, efficiency is due to the reaction of the two long-lived species generated in the plasma, ozone and hydrogen peroxide. Uh, this reaction is called the peroxone reaction or the peroxone process and it leads to the formation of OH radicals. So we have uh, the OH radicals generated in the plasma and as an extra source of uh, OH radicals we have uh, this uh, peroxone process in case of plasma ozonation. And indeed here you see the concentration of OH in the plasma and in the plasma ozonation configuration the concentration is uh, about two times higher. Another combination of plasma with uh, other removal processes, in this case with adsorption, is shown here. This is uh, a configuration used by a research group in, uh, in Ghent, in Belgium. So they are using the adsorption on a nanofiber polyamide membrane in order to increase the local concentration of uh, a pollutant close to the plasma zone. And they have observed that uh, the removal is better in case of plasma adsorption and uh, the G50, the efficiency, uh, is about two times higher when using plasma adsorption as compared to uh, plasma alone. Another possibility is to use uh, catalysts. This has been investigated for uh, quite some time and uh, the iron catalysts are the most famous because they can uh, decompose hydrogen peroxide generated in, in the plasma to form uh, OH radicals. This is called the, the Fenton reaction. And uh, these are some, uh, some results. They are obtained in the DBD with uh, planar configuration with liquid falling film that I uh, talked about before and as you see again uh, the, um, the results are better when using uh, plasma catalysis as compared to plasma alone which is uh, the red data points. Another result also in a DVD with liquid falling film in this case the coaxial version uh, is this one. So again, the, the uh, plasma results are here and the results with uh, plasma combined with iron catalysts are significantly uh, better. And it seems also that uh, the amount of catalyst is important and optimization can, uh, can still be, uh, be made. Other catalysts have been investigated as well, for instance, manganese and cobalt, which are well-known uh, ozone decomposition catalysts, in the same idea to, uh, to generate uh, OH uh, radicals. And again, the results with plasma catalysis appear to be better than with plasma alone. There is also some slight influence on, of the amount of catalyst. Uh, but comparing the manganese and cobalt with the iron catalyst, it appears that uh, iron is still the best. Uh, a few words about the influence of the electrical circuit on the degradation efficiency. So these are uh, results obtained in a corona above liquid, either in negative DC or with positive DC, or in a DBD configuration. They are obtained uh, by the group in Padova. And obviously, uh, the, the best uh, results are obtained with the negative DC corona. 
they are better uh, as, the, uh, as compared to the positive DC and uh, even with the DBD uh, reactor. And these results have been uh, compared and have been explained, in fact, by the more efficient generation of uh, reactive species with this uh, electrical circuit. You see here the concentration of OH radicals, of hydrogen peroxide, of ozone in the liquid and in the gas phase. And in all cases, um, the reactive species concentrations are higher in the negative DC uh, corona than in the other uh, configurations. We have also tried to improve uh, the efficiency by uh, tuning the discharge pulse duration. Uh, you know that we have this uh, pulse corona discharge above liquid and we changed uh, the pulse duration between almost 500 nanoseconds and about 50 nanoseconds. And the decrease in concentration is shown here as a function of treatment time. So as you see, there is uh, not much difference between the results, except for the shorter, uh, shortest pulses, the 55 nanoseconds, when indeed the um, uh, removal slows down a little bit. And then we uh, put the same data as a function of uh, input energy and here we can uh, clearly see a difference. So we can see that we obtain the same uh, removal but at lower input energy if we reduce the pulse duration. And this means, of course, um, increased uh, energy yield. And it's more or less a similar situation for the, uh, for the mineralization. So the results don't differ too much except for the slower mineralization in case of the shortest pulses. So we managed to obtain like this about one order of magnitude increase in the energy efficiency for the removal of 2,4-D by reducing pulse duration in that range. And uh, as I said, the degradation process slows down only for the shortest pulses. And we believe that this is due to uh, the increased efficiency of the short pulses to generate uh, reactive species, ozone and, um, and OH radicals. And we'll see this in the following. So this is the total amount of ozone generated during the experiments uh, as a function of input energy for different pulse durations. So as the pulse duration is reduced, obviously ozone formation is formed with, uh, ozone is formed with uh, higher efficiency. Um, with increasing pulse widths, uh, the, there is a temperature rise and this explains the slower ozone formation because ozone is formed by this reaction and depends, um, the reaction rate, rate constant depends on, on temperature in this way. And then with the temperature rise, there is also an enhanced ozone decomposition by various reactions, for instance, with atomic oxygen, with OH, with HO2, all of them depend, uh, depend on temperature and are favored at uh, higher temperatures. With increasing pulse widths, there is also an increase in uh, hydrogen, in, uh, in water vapor, and uh, this obviously leads to less efficient ozone formation. Uh, then regarding the OH, we have also uh, plotted here the OH for the various pulse duration as a function of input energy. And again, it's more efficient to form OH with uh, short pulses. Uh, we believe that this is due to recombination of OH radicals to form hydrogen peroxide. In case of long pulses, the concentration of OH is higher than the probability to, uh, for this reaction to happen uh, increases as well. And as a proof, we have uh, also the results on hydrogen peroxide, uh, which don't depend uh, at all on the pulse duration 
they depend only on the input energy and by dividing this, uh, this data um, we can indeed uh, show that there is a larger proportion of OH radicals that recombine to form uh, hydrogen peroxide in case of long uh, discharge pulses. I will not go into details regarding the degradation products because I talked about this uh, previously. So um, anyway, it is clear that uh, the degradation products and the degradation mechanism uh, depend on the chemical structure of the uh, organic compound. So if we have compounds with more or less similar structure, the, the steps of uh, the degradation will be similar. Um, if they are different, of course, uh, different steps will, uh, will happen. Uh, then the degradation products depend on uh, uh, the gas in case of the discharges uh, above liquid. So, obviously, in case of um, argon, for instance, we have uh, only uh, OH radical attacks of hydroxyla hydroxylation will be favored, while in case of uh, oxygen discharges, we'll have uh, uh, oxidation, which uh, dominates, and in case of air, uh, nitrogen-containing products can also be detected. Mm, the evolution of the degradation products is, this is something similar that I, I showed before in case of the pesticides, so uh, the degradation products start, start to be formed uh, almost immediately after the discharge uh, is ignited and then they reach a maximum and are degraded in some time. However, um, this time is quite long, so mineralization is um, very time and energy consuming. So it will be good to, uh, to look at these products to see how toxic they are and to stop somewhere on the way when the uh, treated effluent is not harmful uh, anymore to the environment. So in this case, uh, toxicity tests, uh, I'm saying this again, are very important. Uh, about the toxicity of uh, plasma-treated water, I was quite, uh, quite skeptical, not only because they contain all these degradation products, which can or cannot be toxic, but they contain also some uh, oxidizing species, such as residual ozone or hydrogen peroxide or uh, other oxidizers, and some of them uh, are uh, very toxic, so it would be a good idea to, uh, to try to remove them from the treated solutions. So anyway, there are uh, studies that show that the toxicity can be decreased by uh, non-thermal plasma, such as in this case. So with increasing plasma treatment, uh, the toxicity first increases, probably due to the formation of um, uh, degradation products, but then it starts to decrease and as you see at the end of only 10 minutes the toxicity is much lower than uh, the initial values. And there are some other studies that uh, again uh, claim to obtain low toxic or non-toxic uh, plasma treated solutions. But again there are very few uh, studies on, uh, on this topic. We have tried to look at the toxicity uh, to plants. So we have here an example for uh, 2,4-D. These are uh, tomato seeds, uh, which are watered with um, uh, tap water with uh, uh, this pesticide. Uh, tap water uh, with pesticide treated for uh, two minutes, five minutes, uh, 40 and 60 minutes. And clean tap water. So it's clear if we compare these two uh, pictures that uh, the pesticide uh, inhibits growth of the, of the plants. 
uh, the, um, the roots are very small and plants after some time uh, die. Uh, this is more or less the same in case of uh, plasma treated solutions for uh, short treatment times, two, five minutes. But then after the pesticide is uh, eliminated, this is uh, after about 20 minutes, the plants start to grow in a similar manner with the ones watered with uh, clean tap water. And we've measured the roots and the sprouts and compared them and they look uh, similar after uh, 20 minutes of uh, uh, treatment of the solution. However, from uh, these pictures and uh, up to saying that plasma treated wastewater might be used for uh, irrigation, uh, it's quite a long way because, of course, a thorough analysis of the final of the tomatoes in this case should be done to ensure that they are safe for consumption. And now I would like to uh, summarize. So the good news is that uh, recalcitrant pollutants can be successfully degraded by non-thermal plasma. Uh, how fast and how efficient this degradation is uh, depends on a number of factors. It depends on the type of discharge, on its location, if it's in the gas or in the liquid. It depends also on the energy introduced in the plasma. Uh, then um, the chemical structure of the compounds are very important. Uh, the solution characteristics as well and the solution composition. This I did not talk about uh, during the presentation. And the nature of the gas is important in case of uh, discharges in contact with liquid. We can improve the efficiency to some extent by uh, changing the reactor design in order to ensure a large contact area between the plasma and the liquid. Uh, we can also improve uh, the electrical circuit by tuning the, the discharge parameters and, um, and we can improve definitely by combination of plasma with other removal processes as you saw adsorption, ozonation, catalysis or the phantom process. Um, identification of the degradation products is important, firstly from a fundamental point of view in order to determine the degradation pathways and mechanisms and also from a practical point of view to see if these products are toxic and um, how we can uh, uh, improve and adapt the um, uh, treatment technique. Generally, the temporal evolution of uh, the degradation products shows the um, uh, degradation, uh, the further degradation of these products to small molecules in advanced oxidation states. But uh, this does not always happen as I uh, showed in the results of uh, Enal April. Mineralization is also very important. However, it's a slow process and uh, energy consuming and it should be correlated with, with the toxicity of the treated water. And regarding the reuse of plasma treated uh, water for, for irrigation, as I said, uh, it's important to uh, analyze very well the um, uh, quality of the products to see if they are safe for consumption. Thank you very much for your attention, this was all. And I have a few questions here. Okay, so uh, the first one. For the development of the process, where can we imagine plasma treatment? Pollution sites, upstream of treatment plants, or at the level of these plants? Okay, so uh, there are uh, several ideas on, on this uh, issue. It's, uh, the best is to treat uh, the pollutants at the source. So uh, if we're talking of uh, pharmaceuticals, for instance, it would be good to treat uh, the wastewater from the hospitals or to treat uh, the um, 
uh, wastewater from the pharmaceutical manufacturing because there we have a relatively low volume and we have large concentrations and plasma has a chance to uh, really to do something. So it will be upstream, definitely upstream of the treatment plants um, at the pollution site. Because afterwards then um, if this wastewater goes to, to the municipal um, wastewater and it's collected together and then it's basically diluted, then we'll have a huge volume of water and uh, we'll have lower amounts of pollutants. So I would say um, uh, at the source we need to treat this, uh, this wastewater. Uh, the second question, is the mineralization uh, can be the aims of the treatment of these uh, organic compounds? So, if I, if I understand it right, um, you're asking if the mineralization is uh, the final aim. Of course, the mineralization is an ideal. It would be really good to have only carbon dioxide and water. However, mineralization is not really economical because it takes a long, long time. So mineralization is only absolutely required in case of very toxic compounds. And for, for, uh, for the rest, we should go with the degradation as far as, um, as, far as the point where we don't observe any uh, toxic compounds. Okay, and the next, how can, we evol um, how can we evaluate the toxicity of the treated water? So, uh, as I said, there are a few toxicity tests with various uh, kinds of organisms, uh, such, as, uh, uh, such as Daphnia magna, for instance, or uh, some other things, uh, Vibrio fishery, whatever. Um, and uh, they are uh, they are grown. They are uh, you need a, um, a control. Uh, so you put the species one one control with clean water, one um, uh, one with the uh, plasma treated water, so the uh, polluted water, and you compare them. Some of them will die and hopefully they will be healthy enough to, to survive and then you, you will know that the solution is not uh, toxic anymore. In my opinion, you need some biologists to do this. I mean, it's quite difficult to grow these organisms in the lab if you uh, don't, uh, you're not familiar with them, you're not friends with, with them. Okay, as the mineralization is not complete, is there some tests with bacteria used in water treatment plants after plasma treatment? Um, well, this is a question that, <laughs> uh, that left me a bit, um, a bit wondering. So, um, So I'll skip it for now and I will think about it later. <laughs> I'll come back later. Okay, uh, the next, for polluted water in environment by pesticides, for example, can we think to use NTP? If yes, how? Uh, so if the polluted water is already in the environment, let's say in a lake, it's quite difficult to think about uh, using plasma because there will be a huge amount of water and uh, imagine pumping this in a plasma reactor however big and then putting it back into into the lake so I think it's quite complicated it would it would be maybe more easy for uh, groundwater then we can sort of uh, pump it and indeed uh, put it back, but uh, it depends on, on, uh, on how large the volumes are. As you, s as you saw already, 
most of the studies are done at lab scales with very low, uh, value, very low volumes. And even the ones at pilot scale, it's something like uh, hundreds, of, uh, hundreds of liters. So um, upscaling is one, uh, is one of the weak points of non-thermal plasma indeed. Okay, so I think these were all the questions. At least I don't see any other. I don't see any other. Okay. Whoops, there are others. Okay. As the plasma is running in ambient air, what are the other species created in the liquid by the plasma? Do they play a role in the pollutant removal? So when the plasma is in air, besides the oxidizing species that I uh, talked about more, uh, the OH, the, the ozone and the hydrogen peroxide will have um, uh, the RNS reactive nitrogen species as well. Um, we can have nitrates and nitrates in the water and this can be sometimes a problem, but we can have also uh, short-lived uh, RNS uh, such as for instance the peroxynitrate that is a powerful oxidizer as well. Uh, and they can, uh, they can uh, also uh, lead to the uh, removal of uh, such pollutants. Mm, can, we explain, uh, can we expect similar plasma devices to be efficient to degrade or remove mi micro or nanoplastics for, from wastewater? Micro or nanoplastics are uh, uh, really a problem. So. Um, I would say that for, um, for this kind of pollutants, something like filtration may be more uh, appropriate because um, these microplastics are solid materials. It is uh, difficult to believe that plasma can uh, be efficient in this case. Um, I cannot say it for sure because I did not see any study. I thought about it at some point. Can it be? But uh, I would say filtration would, uh, or even maybe adsorption onto something would be more appropriate in case of uh, plastics. And the last one? or. I don't know if it's the last one, but the last one here. How, uh, how is the concentration of OH uh, measured in the process? Yes, I should have mentioned uh, this during my presentation. So OH measurement is not, uh, is not a trivial thing. We are using um, a chemical probe, 3 carboxycumarinic acid, to, uh, to measure the concentration. Um, and uh, the, uh, this, uh, this compound, 3CCA, uh, reacts with the OH and form uh, another product. Uh, so OH is attached somewhere in the 3CCA molecule and form a fluorescent product. And this product can be determined by uh, uh, HPLC, by liquid chromatography. However, we have to be uh, a bit careful with it because um, usually there is a competition between the, the probe and the pollutant that you have and then you need to have quite a lot of probe in order to, uh, to measure correctly uh, the OH and uh, then the, this fluorescent product that is formed and is, that is actually uh, proportional to the concentration of OH can be degraded in plasma as well. So uh, somehow you have to 
uh, to be careful and to measure not only the concentration of the fluorescent pro, uh, product but also the initial product and to compare them and to uh, look closely at the chromatograms so uh, that you see that not other reaction products are formed and you are still in a range when you have, uh, where you have uh, accurate, oops, accurate measurement. Okay, so I see, I see nothing else, but uh, you have a habit of producing more questions? So. Uh, if you have <coughs> Thank you, Monica, for this very nice, uh, interesting presentation. Merci d'avoir suivi donc ce web séminaire. Si vous avez d'autres questions, surtout n'hésitez pas à envoyer vos questions euh, à Monica. Euh, il y avait l'adresse mail, je crois, dans le premier slide. Et de toute façon, il y avait l'adresse mail aussi dans les, euh, les annonces qui ont été faites sur le forum. Euh, dans, bah, par exemple, il y a une heure, enfin, il y a deux heures maintenant. Euh, vous pouvez revisionner donc, ce web séminaire euh, sur un lien qui vous sera communiqué sur le site du réseau. Donc, allez voir sur le site du réseau. Et puis, euh, juste avant de conclure... Euh, N'oubliez pas qu'il va y avoir deux autres web séminaires d'ici la fin de l'année, donc un d'Alexandre Nominé, donc le 9 décembre, qui portera sur l'apport des procédés plasma et laser pour la nanométallurgie hors équilibre. Donc ça, c'est le premier euh, web séminaire. Le deuxième sera donné le 17 décembre à 14h. Il y a des annonces qui vont être faites euh, via le réseau, donc par Jean-Baptiste Sirven donc du euh, CEA, euh, sur les LIPS, donc Laser Induced Breakdown Spectroscopy. Euh, donc euh, voilà, je vous remercie à tous, on vous remercie. Okay.